All right, thank, thank you, Anina. Really appreciate that. Um, so, in case you don't know who I am, uh, by now, my name is Han Nox. I'm a creator director at Reactor. Um, very happy to be here. Very happy to see all of you here as well. So, um, I'm going to be talking about three main points today. One, I'm going to be talking about design process in general, why, why, why we use, why we establish process in the first place, and also what kind of challenges can we see in them today in terms of, of the environment that we have to use them. And, and, and then the second point is, is um, uh, what would be the core qualities of a highly functioning design team of today and tomorrow um, um, that can endure and, and can face adversity uh, uh, when, when everything around is so complex today, and increasingly so. And then, what would be uh, a good starting point of five principles that you can utilize, that you can try and, try and embed in your work and in your teams that can start building these qualities? Um, so yeah, design processes. Uh, everybody's favorite topic, right? I can see people nodding their heads violently. Yay. No, but, but um, regardless of, of, of what you think of design processes, whether you think that they're the silver bullet to every, every uh, problem-solving situation or whether you think that there are things that kill creativity, the fact is that um, the world is full of processes. Processes are everywhere. Um, um, whatever you think of them, you have one, you act according to one, or several in, in and outside of work. Um, and, and really since the uh, age of the Industrial Revolution, our world has been built on top of processes. Um, and, and the same thing applies to, to our world of design. Um, for decades, we've been establishing, forming processes that, that make sense of, of, of um, of how to attack problems and form solutions. And, and really, if you look at the way that we visualize uh, how we work today, how, um, how we commit the acts of designing, uh, and how we talk about it, the words we use, you realize that whether you're a fervent follower or a believer in certain type of processes, processes are so established and ingrained in and how we think about design and how we do design all the way to the, the words that we use. Um, you really, really see the uh, profound effect that they've had um, on us and on our work. They are helpful. They are needed in, 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 in some cases. Don't get me wrong. I'm not here to bash on processes per se. They are things that, that navigate us through ambiguity. They, we use them to make sure that the um, 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 problems and solutions we work on are, are well, well uh, researched, explored, and validated before we commit to them. Um, and, and processes have been helpful to me in multitude of ways throughout my career. This here is, is Yang Hannu, many moons ago. Uh, a junior designer early in his career, uh, a little unsure of himself, not sure how his capabilities uh, meet the needs of, of, of doing this digital stuff thing. Um, um, I entered the world of doing digital products and services um, um, as a graphic designer. That's, that's my background and that's still very much my core skill. Um, um, so quite a narrow entry point in a way, uh, which I think is, is pretty common uh, when, when you start as a junior. Uh, and, and processes were a tool for me to understand and to paint the bigger picture of, of the spectrum of design and kind of like pinpoint myself there and understand uh, how I relate um, um, to, to other practices and, and, and skills in design. And, and also, also help me to understand um, if, what do I have to do, what do I have to start learning if I want to have a bigger role and impact in my work. Um, 
But as you gain experience, if you, if, if, if you in the audience, you have a few projects under your belt, if you have some battle scars, um, you probably experienced failure using design processes as well. The fact is that, that, that processes fail, regardless of how meticulous your design process is, how detailed is, how it is, how rigorously you follow one, it's not a guarantee of a good design outcome. Um, um, you might not even get to the end. Reasons for that happening can be, can be a, a million different things. It can be the fact that, that uh, you and your team actually understand the design process uh, in a different way, meaning that, that you might um, uh, be using the same words to describe your work, but the activities you perform are actually completely different. So there's misalignment in there. Or, um, or um, the process becomes kind of like the master itself, you know, the process following a detailed process um, um, becomes the focus of the work itself, or, or you start retrofitting problems into a process. You have a certain way of doing things, whatever kind of problem gets thrown at you, you just push them through that one process and maybe compromising the things that you're trying to solve in the first place. Um, but, but the reasons why, why we fail at work or how, why our processes fail is not actually the most interesting thing to me. Uh, the interesting is, is the observation that, that the amount of these different kind of curveballs that are being thrown at us in our work um, that, that threaten to derail the work or change the direction of it or, or just push off of the tracks, the amount of those kind of curveballs I think it just keeps increasing all the time. And what I'm talking about really is, is this. Um, this is us today, um, or a snapshot of it at least. Um, um, basically the world um, that we work in today, and in increasing speeds, there's just like so many things that are fighting for attention. Um, um, so many things that we have to account for, good and bad, so many things that we have to be wary of, so many things that put con constraints on us, and so many things that, that uh, uh, give us new tools and abilities and opportunities to, to do different kind of design work. It might be transformation in the ways of working in your company. It might be uh, new interaction models that, that uh, you, you uh, can and, and have to design for that spur new kind of user behavior. It might be AI and you don't really understand if that's good or bad. Or, or it might be ethics and privacy of the users, uh, which, which uh, I think we all agree that, that it has, has become an, an, an immediate concern uh, uh, in the digital era. Uh, the point is that, that, the, that basically the world of design, the act of design, our job as designer, is, is, is far more complex today than it was yesterday. And it will be more complex tomorrow than it is today. Why I think this is a challenge for us, why it is such a big problem for us, is that um, historically, the way we work the way we do design hasn't been the most open and inclusive. Um, basically, you know, you hand me a problem, I'll go work in, in, in some secrecy and come back and hand you a solution. Um, that's how I learned to work in, in, in design agencies uh, um, um, earlier in my career. Um, but if we look at the environment that we are in today and how much is changing and, and the requirements that is set on us um, because of it, uh, mystifying our work doesn't, doesn't cut it anymore. Um, it's something that we, we just have to stop doing uh, to meet these new demands. We have to step out of, out of our black boxes as designers. An example of, 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 of evolution to meet new demands, I think, is the rapid evolution of design, team, uh, design tools. Um, basically, uh, go back a few years and the tools that we use to, to create artifacts, to design interfaces, were pretty stagnant. Um, um, and, and they weren't meeting the demands of, of, um, of the environments uh, that we had to design in, the problems that we were trying to solve, the different devices, whatever. 
um, and, and then became a flux of, of, of uh, new kind of design tools in the last few years that solve particular problems acro across um, um, this, the design process. And how we design, um, how we think about it, how we act, it's, it's under the same kind of pressure today. Um, the world is too complex, it's changing too quickly. And, and, and if anything, the world has become highly unpredictable, meaning our work has become highly unpre unpredictable. And we need to be prepared um, um, for things to change at any given time. And I believe that strict, meticulous design processes just don't cut it anymore. So if we accept the fact that our work is becoming more challenging all the time, if we accept the fact that, that um, 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 the work can go off the rails at, at any given time, um, I don't believe that we need new or better processes. I don't actually think that something like that can exist, per se. Um, we don't need that. What we need are better ways to, to react when a failure happens. The highly functioning design team of, of today and tomorrow, it's, it's flexible, it's able to cope with failure, uh, and, and is able to react to failure. The core qualities of, of a highly functioning design team are, one, it's resilient, meaning that, that through social support of, of your teams, your peers, your, your organization, and having the safety to fail, um, um, you're able to be resilient, meaning that you have the capability to face adversity when you're struck down, you have uh, um, a ways to get back up again and try again. And two, the highly functioning design team of today and tomorrow, it's adaptable, meaning that it has the ability to respond to change. When change happens, you, we, we just don't have just the energy to get back up, but we actually have, have means to, to answer to new demands. Um, that kind of a team has the mindset of all solutions are temporary, meaning that any solutions uh, you put in place today you know that, that they might, might be old tomorrow, and we are ready to go again. And third quality is that the highly functioning design team of t today and tomorrow is learning focused, meaning that in addition to, to striving for good design outcomes for, for, for our users and our businesses, our team is also learning focused. Uh, meaning that, that learning is one of the goals and, and, and it, it regularly puts focus in, in, in improving the way we work. I really love this statement, uh, principles over processes. And, and what it means to me in this context that I'm talking about is that, that um, Processes come and go, they might change, but, but principles are what remain. Principles are the things that, that keep our work, our designs anchored to something, um, uh, regardless of whether processes are in flux. Um, so if we, if we think about like what kind of principles we could have in place that could help us, us work in a way that those core qualities that I just talked about uh, could be strengthened. Um, there is actually a school of thinking um, that we can draw some inspiration from. It's a school of thinking that, that most of us at least know by name, if not by experience, um, that has been for a pretty long time um, um, being challenged with these kind of things and trying to find solutions for them. That school of thinking is called Agile Software Development, or Agile, in short. Something that, that many of us still have quite a lot of misconceptions about uh, in, in, in design. Um, people can be, designers can be wary of it. Creatives can be downright objective to, to the world Agile. 
Um, yes, I mean, one part of Agile can be, you know, you know releasing software quickly, uh, working in small iterations, working in quick sprints. Yes, that can be part of it, but, but uh, we can look beyond that. Um, if, if you look beyond just the delivery of software, um, there are principles in place that, that um, we can draw inspiration to our design challenges as well. So, taking cues from Agile software development, here are five principles for highly functioning design teams. One, be radically transparent and share. Um, the demands that are put on us, but equally also the opportunities that are given to us today, means that design can't be a mystic black box operation anymore. Um, we have to demystify our design processes and commit to making your work and your decisions more visible, more transparent. And, and uh, what you get in return is also increased valuation and understanding of the work that you're doing with, with, with uh, people that are not designers but are also uh, highly um, uh, relevant to the work that you're doing. Make a commitment to, to share your work and then make yourself available at any given time. Um, this is something that I, I, I really want to stress because I haven't been comfortable doing this. I, I have come from, from kind of like a background and I know many sh designers, uh, at least historically, has, has shared this, is that, that you know, that, that we want to own the problems that we're solving. And, and I think that's one of the reasons why, why we've kind of like mystified a lot of the ways that we work. But that just doesn't work anymore. And, and we have to be, get comfortable being more open uh, and inclusive about the way we design and talk about it. Principle number two, set clear explicit goals. Um, I mean, I, I, this might mean pretty basic and... and and, and, and obvious, but it's still something that, that we consistently fail at. Um, it's hugely important that at all times we are explicit with each other. What are we aiming for? Every activity that we perform should be taking uh, us closer to our goals. And if we don't have those uh, goals in place, we also lose the ability to evaluate whether we're actually doing the right things at all. Um, another very important, crucial matter is, is that, that when, when you talk about goals and you set them throughout your processes, that you set them together with your team. Misalignment in, in, in the understanding of what we're actually trying to achieve is, is what makes or breaks projects, products, um, uh, whatever. Um, three, established feedback loops. Um, the uh, um, premise of feedback loops is very simple. You do some work, uh, you put into place something that, that enables to measure the impact of your work, and the next time you do the same work better because you have new information. Whether you call it trial and error or whether you call it course correction, feedback loops are how we learn. Um, this is something that, that, that I've also struggled with. Um, uh, many of us designers have this notion of perfection. Like, like, like we, we grab something and we want to make it perfect before we give it out to the world. Um, um, and, and that's understandable. That's, that's been me as well. But the fact is that, that for us to reach perfection, we can no longer to do that. Um, perfection is not reached. Uh, um, anymore that way because it's dependent on so many different things and so many different people that, that it's just something that you can't reach on your own. So try to design just enough, try to understand what is, what is enough design to, to start getting feedback and that learns to continuously learn on, on whether what you're doing is actually is the right thing or not. Um, and also maximize the ways that you get feedback. And, and these can be really simple. I'm not just talking about things like, like user testing, which is obviously ex extremely valuable and, and should be done, done uh, uh, whenever it makes sense. 
but I'm talking about, you know, pair designing, co-designing, challenging other people outside of, of your profession of design to, to have conversations with you. Um, those are also feedback loops. Those will also help you to make better informed decisions. Principle number four, retrospect. Uh, the idea of retrospectives um, 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 comes from Agile, obviously, and can be an immensely valuable tool for, tool for you and your teams. Uh, I don't actually care if, if you do them by the book or if you call them um, retrospectives or none, but, but the main point is that what we have to do is that at regular intervals, we have to stop and, and shift focus for a period to, to look and understand how we are actually working and, and, and is there something that, that we can do to improve them. So that we're not just like talking and thinking about the outcomes or the results of our work, but also the way we are working. And this is an extremely easy thing to forget and stop doing as a team, or you might not be doing them at all at the moment. Um, and you're a designer, design the design process. Utilize those hard-earned skills to solve problems also in the ways um, that, that you and your team is working, not just the problems that you're trying to solve for, for um, um, your coworkers or stakeholders or clients or customers or whatever. Use those skills. Principle number five, don't be a dick. This doesn't actually come from Agile, as far as I know, but it's probably the uh, most important principle that I have on display here. We have a history of making ourselves special. Designers have a history of making, making themselves special. And, and, and we still have and will continue to have an integral part in, in things we're creating and designing and building, uh, but we're just like one important part of a, of a bigger puzzle. So let's stop being design heroes and actively in, invite others and, and, and uh, others into the process of creating things and collaborate with them. This is not just a means of giving, like, like we're not giving something away um, to the benefit of others, but it's something also that you will need. As I mentioned other, uh, earlier is that, that um, the things that we're trying to solve, the environment that we're working in, we as designers just can't cope, can't solve those problems on our own anymore. And you will, will have to actively collaborate with others to do your work as well as you want to. So as a summary, a highly functioning design team is one, it's resilient. Uh, through, through social support and, and safety fail, it's able to be resilient, it's able to face adversity and get back up again what is, whenever it's struck down. And two, it's ad adaptable. It is able to respond to change. It has the kind of mi mindset, that experiential mindset that, that um, understands that, that all solutions are temporary. Three, that team is focused on learning. It also focuses on trying to improve the ways uh, that we're working. And five principles to, to drive those qualities for highly functioning design teams. One, be radically transparent. Two, set clear explicit goals. Three, establish feedback loops. Four, retrospect. And five, let's not be dicks. Thank you. Do we have questions for Hannu? Please. Yes. Where is our mic person? There. there. Perfect. Hi, it's Ismo. The mm -hmm. uh, question is that um, imagine uh, you have a corporation which does not have a design team and you are hired there to build a design team. How would you do it? Um, 
quick. Well, to, to repeat some of the things that Shay Douglas said today, I think like one thing would, would be patient. I would have to be very patient, if, if, if it's, it's, especially if it's an organization that, that doesn't have design in any form part of its culture, like, like they haven't, for example, worked with designers much before. Um, so, so I would be have, have to be careful not to drive too much change too quickly. Um, but, but I would try to make um, my work visible. I would try to make it more understandable, like, like what kind of benefit I could bring to, to different people um, 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 within the organization and then work actively with them and try and, try and, try and uh, solve problems together with them. Um, I would probably try to strategically um, um, determine key people there can, can, that can become ambassadors for, for me to, to spread the uh, benefits of design and then get them on my side. That's probably where I would start. Other questions? Yes, please. Thanks for the talk. You're welcome. Um, I was wondering that um, there are sort of two sides in, in the design, uh, especially what comes to consultancy. So there's the execution of, of the design work, and I've also been thinking about how the design process should be more of a, uh, like, you need to react to things depending on what comes from this phase, what uh, you, you know what needs to be done next. Uh, but then there's the sales side as well. And often on the sales side, you have to somehow describe your approach. How, how would your design team or you, as the design members of this project, how would you deal with this issue? What, what, what would be your design process like and so on? So have you been thinking about that? How to, uh, in other words, how, or uh, first of all, how to keep the design process in practice uh, this kind of responsive, uh, this kind of responsive model, but also how to describe it clearly enough in the sales pitch or the slides or whatnot. Um, that that's that's a very good question, and and uh, I, I don't think that we've really found the silver bullet at Reactor for that as well, um, for that either. Um, I think what helps, and, and if, we, if we're specifically talking about selling our work as, as consultancies, I think like one important thing that, that can kind of like take the weight out of, of trying to really explain in detail how you're going to go about solving problems for your clients is that you, you give them the feeling that you understand what their problems are or you give them the indication that, 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 that you'll be able to understand their world. Um, so, so put some emphasis on, you know, uh, understanding their business when you when you talk with them and 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 challenge them to to talk about their their problems with you and and may, maybe that's the first first goal is that that you convince them that you ca care about their problems. Um, I'm not I'm very hesitant to describe in detail when 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 we talk with our clients that how we are gonna actually go about. Uh, um, um, our process, let's put it that way. But, but you have to do it some way on a high level because kind of like a design process also, especially in those kind of situations, is a communication tool. And, and, and um, clients will want to feel safe that, that you know what you're doing. Um, but again, it comes, comes back down to, so maybe, so maybe you explain some kind of a process that can, can convince the client when, when you're trying to land a project. Um, 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 if we're thinking about from a sales focus. But when you actually land that project and, and, and you started, then I think the most important thing is just to focus on building trust with the client. And, and if you have that, then it's not such a big of a deal if you have to, to change course from a predefined process if, if that's what you need to do. I'm not sure if I answered your question. Okay, cool. Yes.
Hi. Thanks. Always a pleasure listening to you. Uh, how do you think uh, teaching design thinking or design to doing should change and evolve uh, since it's evolving in such a rapid pace, the, the service design or mm -hmm. design in general? Do you think uh, that the double diamond or processes still have <laughs> like a base that you have to first get before you can continue on your journey to becoming a service designer? Yeah, I mean, um, um, a, a, as I said previously, like processes or different kind of tools or visualizing different kind of tools is still immensely helpful for us in multitude of ways. One one is obviously communication, and it's something that helps people to to come together and understand how we're going to go about and trying to solve a problem. I think in terms of of education, and 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 to be honest, since I've never graduated from anywhere, so so like like I I don't have a lot of experience how. For example, design thinking or service design or different methods are are teached in in universities. Uh, for example, at Aalto today, um, I don't have a lot of visibility understanding of that. But I hope that one thing that they're they're teaching alongside these methods um, um, is is uh, being critical um, and and uh, being experimental. And, and not kind of like uh, marrying to a process very early on, in, in both in your career, but, but, but uh, on a smaller scaling projects. Um, being critical of, of the way that you're working and is there something that, that um, you have to do about it. Because I think actually, you know, the capability to, to change course and try something different, that's, that's obviously very important. But if you don't realize the fact that you have to do something differently, then that capability is, is useless. So, so being critical and trying to understand situations where we m should maybe try to change course and try something different is actually the skill that, that I would try to focus on building instead of you know, uh, specific methods or, or, or what happens after. Um, um, we have a changed course. Thanks, Hanno. Great presentation. Uh, You're welcome, Marcus. I somehow feel the atmosphere here and the kind of the, the audience is very sharing the principles and kind of agreeing with what you're saying. Uh, on the other hand, sometimes you hear customers Kind of, or, or have you heard customers maybe in the U.S. or here in Finland disagreeing on these principles, or kind of actually like looking at it and saying, nodding the head and then saying, I, "Because I've heard this sentence once." Well, you know, Marcus, the design is just a couple of slides, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've 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 heard something similar, and 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 uh, I, I think like like the number one thing is that that. Um, we, we, we have those principles for us in our design and product and engineering teams and keep, keep true to them ourselves. Because like first and foremost, I think they're, they're, they're bringing value to us and, 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 and in, uh, increasing our ability to do good, do, do good work. Um, but, but again, the changing that perception of, of design with, with people that, that might have, you know, a very different view of what the value of it is. It's just something that requires a lot of commitment, a lot of patience, um, and, and a lot of focus. Um, and, and usually increasing your ability to good work is, is, is a way to, to increase that evaluation of design in, in, in our organizations as well. Hello, uh, thank you. Um, You're welcome. About being a dick, mm. it's something uh, I'm kind of uh, exploring myself. Uh, I'm concerned that uh, while we're being uh, designers, we kind of lifted ourselves up maybe a bit. We're being dicks and mm. our echo is huge and all that. And that's making us bad, really mm. bad designers because we are distancing ourselves from the users and users. So I'm sort of... Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, totally I'm, agree. I'm one... Um, I'm Exploring how to avoid that, how to come back, mm. how to come back to the, uh, an updated day-to-day -day life mm. and, and work and, and a sort of how yeah. to avoid that. I, I don't know if that's uh, something you maybe consider individually or as a team, leading a team. 
Yeah. Um, it took me a pretty long time to understand that, that I actually thought that I was special and somehow, or, or the uh, skills or the capabilities that I present are, are somehow special. Um, and and I, I didn't understand that uh, until just a few years ago after I had joined Reactor and then was kind of like exposed to working in, in, in more diverse teams and different kind of projects. Um, and it wasn't a nice experience for me to kind of like like breaking out of that shell and, and it wasn't from my own will, but, but I happened to have people around me and in, in my team, engineers for example, that really challenged me to work with them. Um, and, and when that happened, my initial reaction was like, like why are you bothering me? You know, why are you taking my time away from designing? I should be designing and ta not talking about it with you. Um, um, that was my initial reaction. Um, but, but luckily I had people around me who kind of like, like were patient about it. Uh, I don't, I don't, maybe I was dick to them, I don't know. But, but at least like, like I was not super willing to collaborate with them in the beginning. I was in my, in my own world doing interfaces and then, you know, shipping them over to them. Um, but, but the fact that, that there were people that kind of like forced me to do design with them is, is, is kind of the start of a process where I started shedding this, this uh, idea of, of being special and, and you know that, that, that design is something that belongs to me and then I have to keep hold of it, shedding this, this idea. And, and again, it's come through experience. I've just had positive experiences that I'm doing a lot better design working in that way and that's a great motivation as well um, and also the fact that I think that just like like if 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 your ego does get in in the way and and you still have those kind of challenges at some point you're just gonna hit a wall and you're gonna realize that you're not able to do your work anymore that way uh, as I said earlier the problems that we're we're solving the problem spaces that we're working in are so complex and they will just get more complex that that you know you 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 won't live on your own, basically. Wow! Thank you. I think that was quite a quite a good uh, last comment. All right. Th thanks for Hanno and big thank applause. You very much.